Good morning, everyone. Uh, you can hear me. That's good to see. Um, great to see you all, and thank you so much to my lovely panel. Uh, my name is Ravi Mathieu. I'm the managing editor of Dealbook, a newsletter on business and policy at the New York Times. Um, and I can't think of a topic more apt today than AI and open source. As you'll probably be aware, NVIDIA is reporting results later today. Um, they're now the second most valuable publicly traded company in the world above three trillion and challenging Apple for the most valuable publicly traded company, which just gives you a sense of how big the AI boom has become since uh, that moment in 2022 when uh, OpenAI unveiled ChatGPT. But within the AI world, there's a big fight going on, as you'll all be aware, um, between those who are trying to build proprietary models and probably try to dominate this space thinking of OpenAI, possibly Google, possibly Anthropic, um, and raising absolutely enormous sums of money on the back of that, versus another camp, which is the open source advocates. Um, we have a few of those here today, but perhaps the most vocal in that camp is Jan Nukun of Meta, who's accused his rivals of trying to uh, scare governments with catastrophizing the effects of AI and trying to capture the effort to regulate and what that will look like. At the same time, uh, the geopolitics, which we've been talking about a bit, uh, are pretty present. Obviously, we have a new administration in the US, um, and one tech entrepreneur is at the heart of all of that in Elon Musk, who has his own ideas, which occasionally uh, seem to contradict themselves around AI. So we're going to talk about open source, um, with some real pushers of that idea, what works and what doesn't. Um, Tomas, let me start with you. Hugging Face is obviously at the heart, really, of this kind of revolution in open source AI development. Just to get us kicking, tell me why, from the start, you've always been very keen that open source is the way to go. Lay out that case for us. <coughs> yeah, there's a lot of reason, but I would say the first, the main one, and, and probably speaks a lot to, to, to startups' heart as well, is I think it, it's level, it levels the playing field a lot. When you want to start from you know, a, a model and to adapt it to your new use case, your new application you have in mind, it's really cool. You can start from an open weight model and just fine tune it, for instance, on some of your data, or you can dive in it and try to tweak it and to actually use it. If you had to go all the way from you know, training your own GPT-3 just to be able to adapt it to your use case, I think would be, uh, it would be very sad. So that's one reason. Another very more like a mission-based idea is um, I think AI is really a fundamental technology just like the internet, which is going to change everything we do in a way, it's going to diffuse, you know, just like nowadays you have, you have the internet everywhere and if you don't have access to the network, when, you, when I just landed here in the country, I was like, oh, I hope I can reach the, the, the network now because we've become so dependent from that in, in many ways. I think AI is going to be one of these technologies that's going to be everywhere, you know? And if you think about a breakthrough technology like that, you want this to be accessible to everyone. You don't want this to be like the, the, the private field of just, just two companies, right? You want as many players to be able to, 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 to provide access to this technology. And so I think it's the core reason why we think, you know, having a lot of players, a lot of diversity in AI is actually a good thing for the, the future. Okay, Kunle, I'm gonna bring you in on this. I'm gonna jump over you, Grace, sorry, forgive me. Uh, Kunle, Samba Nova, in Portuguese, that means new dance. And you had this idea to really in hone in on the infrastructure of AI, and you have a very kind of different aspect to the AI equation that you're trying to figure out. And there's this quote that you use about looking forward with the profound mind, the idea that you need to kind of have some of that fundamentals to figure out what you're going to do next. Tell me about your particular angle on where you can fit in that open source conversation. Well, so we were early proponents of open source. Yeah, one of our co-founders, Chris Ray, you know, identified the fact that these open source models were going to be available and were going to compete 
uh, with the uh, closed source models uh, in terms of their accuracy and their capabilities. And he was absolutely right. And so we leaned in, and uh, as Thomas said, uh, what open source does is it levels the playing field. So it doesn't just level the playing field for the users, it levels the playing field for the infrastructure providers. Because then we can focus on how do we make that open source model run as efficiently as possible. And uh, so, you know, going forward, it is about creating the ability uh, to, to run these open source models very efficiently. Uh, users want to be able to take advantage of the huge amount of uh, compute that goes into training these models and then use those models uh, to uh, focus on their particular problems, fine tuning those models and then owning the, the model, right? Instead of giving your data to OpenAI or to one of the, the closed uh, source providers, you get to own that model. And so the other piece of uh, focusing on the open source model is that all that work has been put into training the model and now you want to do inference on that model and actually get that model uh, to give you uh, some benefit at, at, you know, at, at, at the at, at application level. And so what we're seeing is a lot more compute being moving to what's called inference time or test time. And so this means you know, the sorts of things that, that um, uh, OpenAI is doing with O1 uh, where you have chain of thought, you've got sequential uh, uh, calling of these models, you've got parallel calling of these models, where you've got multiple models which are being accessed at the same time and you compare the results. And so the whole landscape of compute is going to be dominated by inference and high speed token generation because these inference uh, 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 heavy applications, people call them agentic applications or compound applications, are going to require a lot of tokens and, and they're going to require high token speed. And so that's the sort of infrastructure that we're developing at Samba Nova Systems. All right, Grace, let me come to you as an investor. You're a backer of Tomas, next to me. Um, and you've spoken about OpenAI being a huge, huge advantage and, and, and the appeal of that as someone who is who's backing companies, and obviously a lot of startups in the crowd will probably be knocking on your door after this. <laughs> um, tell us why the open bit is so important when you're looking for companies to fund. Totally. Well, just for introduction, we're a deep tech, frontier tech fund based between New York and the Bay Area, and again, lucky to have led the Series A of Hugging Face. But three main reasons. One, Tomas already mentioned, right, we are seeing it level the playing field, increase transparency and accessibility to create open science in the hands of many instead of the hands of few. Also from a performance perspective, right, that test time compute, we've actually seen smaller models are outperforming larger models, and that's basically applying more compute at that uh, inference or usage time, like by 14x uh, improvement, or 14x larger models, they're doing much better. But third, and really why I'm excited, is it's more efficient. So not just from a compute perspective, but from an economic perspective. So let's just take uh, a little analogy uh, for a second, right? You're seeing these frontier AI models spending billions on compute. You know, we often say internally at Lux, if you're spending a billion dollars on something, there's probably a better way. Take that and apply it to a little bit of a sports car analogy, right? These frontier models are building the Lamborghini, the very luxury supercharged model. And that can be really good for some use cases. But you know, Clem actually was at our AI summit and said you don't need a private jet to go to work, right? And often these smaller models, the Toyota car as an example, can get you from point A to point B. And just one more kind of example on that, we're investors in a company called Sakana AI. They're like the deep mine for Japan. A uh, really cool company doing novel research in evolutionary algorithms, kind of inspired by nature. But their latest model just took eight GPUs to train. That's in big contrast to 75,000 GPUs. You're seeing some of the latest frontier models leveraging to be trained on. And Together AI out of Stanford is doing some really cool novel architectures and state space models that are not just you know, really performant, but really efficient, you know, 11x cheaper than, than GPT-40 in many cases. Mm. Just to pick up on that, is part of your bet also though that open will lead to a revenue model that's sustainable more quickly than close? Because you mentioned the kind of money that you know, some of, your, rival, some of the, uh, your rivals are putting into some of the proprietary systems. It's kind of, you know, it's huge. It's kind of hard to comprehend some of this stuff. Well, it goes back to kind of the performance of open source rivaling closed source. You're actually already seeing these open source models like Llama's meta models 
becoming a lot more efficient. And if you contrast that to OpenAI GBT 3.5, right, that actually drove down prices 50%. So you're seeing open source actually put pressure on these closed source models. So I think that layer is actually getting more commoditized from an investment mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah. And the value comes from what you're building on top when everyone already has access to these awesome technologies. Building on top, that brings me to Tomas. Now, you've obviously, as I said, been at the heart of this kind of exponential growth in this space. I often meet startups, let's say they kind of you know, employ 10 fewer people just because they pulled some module off Hugging Face to build their, their, their new startup or whatever it might be. Tell me about what you're seeing in terms of behavioral change with the clients that are using Hugging Face products, what kind of scale you're looking at, and, and maybe even project into the future what you're kind of looking at next. Yeah, I think um, what we witnessed, uh, uh, and that's, yeah, has been this really huge increase in models, number of models, diversity. So just a couple of weeks ago, we passed one million models on the hub, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. You know, like a couple of years ago, there was just one model out there, BERT, for people who were already, uh, already in, the, in the AI field. And now we have one million. They are all like different variants, like, six, like very successful models like Llama have thousands, like I think Lama has 1,800 1, diverse like variants that have been fine-tuned by people on various, various uh, data sets. W what we saw, I think, recently has been both this, this huge increase in, in number and also the huge increase in uh, diversity. So I think uh, an obvious change in 2024 was the move from, from purely text model to image and text model. Uh, just, just yesterday, Mistral released a, a new Pixral model, but more recently, two weeks ago, Quen released a new Quen vision language. So this move to more modalities has been a huge trend of, of, of 2024. Speech has started to become really huge, uh, driven by maybe first like the, the real-time API from, from, uh, from uh, OpenAI, but then very quickly we had this Llama multi-model, then, then a, a, a set of, of speech models that were able both to understand and to, and to generate speech. I think one of the large trends for, for next year is also going to be robotics. I think, uh, Lux, you, you know the field very well. Open source robotics is going to be very huge. It's starting to work right now. Like, I think uh, last, last month there was really an amazing uh, demo. Uh, but I mean, there are like amazing demo every week, to be honest, in robotics, but like ama amazing research products. Mm -hmm. um, so next year, I, I really see that coming. And what we see also is now we're moving to this kind of model that are able to use tools and go in the direction of maybe agents, but that could work. I think we started to, to work a little bit on agents a bit too early, but now with models can really use tools, I think next year is going to be a big year for, for agents, both in closed and open source as well. So I think I, this huge diversity of you know application and uh, integration. Couldn't they, you want to comment on that? Yeah, yeah. I, I think you know agents are going to be really big in 2025, and and, and are already starting to to uh, show that their their worth, and sort of building a AI application as a thin wrapper around a uh, uh, a model is is so 2022, right? So going forward, it's going to be about a lot thicker layer of intelligence. Uh, that uses the model as a module that gets called multiple times. And in fact, each of the models could be different. So you could have specialized models for different purposes that come together in a complex uh, logic uh, that actually delivers uh, the model. And this has two ramifications. One is for uh, the uh, you know, startups and application developers. Uh, like yourselves, there'll be a lot more to do, right, in, in terms of actually matching the, the needs of these agentic applications to the, uh, uh, to the business workflows or this particular application use cases. The second will be uh, the, the role that open source uh, will, will play in providing this agentic orchestration layer, this programming layer, right? So there are a couple of, of, of emerging standards. DSPy is, is some work that's come out of Stanford, which is a way to combine multiple models together. And then Llama Stack is, is another uh, approach that, that people are, are looking at. And so uh, from the point of view of, of Samba Nova, we're looking at how can we take these orchestration layers and run them very efficiently, right? As I said, Fundamentally, uh, when it comes down to these agentic applications, it will be about how you can generate tokens 
very quickly, how you can uh, support multiple different models very efficiently, and how you can make sure that the whole uh, uh, in environment uh, runs very smoothly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, uh, 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 you know, that those are the kind of components I think are going to drive the future of uh, AI models. And if I may just quickly add to that, right, it's important to distinguish what open source actually is, right? We have open source models, you have the Llama models, you have the amazing repository of models you can access on Hugging Face. You also have a lot of closed source data sets, right, and that you may be combining them together, whether that's the proprietary data in your warehouse, in your research lab, in your factory, and combining those together, we're often seeing folks do in tandem. So open source isn't necessarily a catch-all term, you can still leverage an open source model and train that you know, on your own data set. And one robotics example, just to finish that thread, is a company called Physical Intelligence. They're an amazing team of researchers at Stanford and Berkeley and Google, and they're kind of building a general foundation layer for robotics and AI, kind of like a robotics brain that can work across you know, any different robot with this software AI layer. And they are using an open source model, a VLM vision language model under the hood with a proprietary data set that they've collected in-house. So I think they're going to continue to see more of that in the next few years. Yeah. Did you want to come in, Thomas? Yeah, definitely. I mean, a, a last trend just to, to to, to push on direction you're talking about is this trend to smaller model, which is maybe a bit surprising, but 2024 has seen like this compression of size of model. We started the year with like GPT-3 at 170 70 billion parameters, and now we're ending with model that are 10 times smaller, but almost as powerful. I think one striking result I saw la la last month was that the, the new Llama 1B model, so 1 billion parameter, was beating the, the Llama model of last year 10 billion parameters. So this, this 10 times reduction in size of model is very, is very exciting, I think. Yeah. So it's exciting also for what you're saying, inference, right? If you can have a small model, maybe it can fit on your smartphone, on your laptop, it can be next to you. Latency is going to be very small, very short. It's also very interesting for robotics because you don't want your robots to, to spend its time thinking every time, like two seconds when it sees something happening. You, you want the robots to react with very low latency. So this new trend is exciting. It's a trend where open source is very well positioned because a closed source model is uh, usually a business model work by paying for the token. So there is not an inherent incentive to actually give you, you know, a small model that you can put on your smartphone or locally. There is more this incentive to you know, call a data center and then to pay for the token, basically. So open source has been leading the way, I think, in, a, in, a, in small model. And I'm quite excited to see that continuing next year. Okay. I want to cover you because you, you mentioned it quite a few times this idea of efficiency, and that kind of comes across quite strongly in all the literature and all the kind of stuff you talk about at Samba Nova. How are you seeing this play out in terms of making that process efficient? Like, can you just give us an example of where we've gone from in a year, a year ago to where we are now and where we're going to go next? Because the efficiency bit seems really key, both in terms of the devices we're accessing, Tomas mentions mobile, but the whole question on energy use around AI is obviously yeah. a huge, a huge yes. big cloud over this. Yeah, huge. I mean, I, you know, to, to uh, riff on, on what Thomas was saying about small models, right? So one of the ways of, of using small models is to run them multiple times. It turns out that they've got the same information a lot of the time uh, that the big model has. It's just that you need to ask the model multiple times and figure out when the answer is, is correct. This is called sampling. And you can run that small model very efficiently uh, that then you can, in fact, you know, do better than running the large model. But whether you're running large models or small models, you want to be able to provide uh, the, the, the tokens uh, with a very efficient platform. And one of the things that we've done at, at uh, Samba Nova is by using a fundamentally better architecture for AI, a better hardware architecture and a better software architecture, we can get uh, five to 10 times uh, the, uh, the speed for token generation compared to an, an NVIDIA uh, H100, for instance. We're comparing our latest chip, uh, the SN40L, uh, to the H100. So that's one thing. And so the other issue is power, right? And so you want to be able to deploy that uh, rack in a data, set, data center that was designed for air-cooled uh, um, uh, uh, equipment. Right? And, and so if you have to go to liquid, there's a huge amount of uh, capital expense in retrofitting your data center in order to put in some of the latest uh, uh, NVIDIA hardware. But by having things, uh, by having compute that's more efficient, that can be air-cooled, you can uh, actually put the systems in the existing infrastructure, which means that you can run your, uh, your, your data center without 
the huge capital expense and you can generate tokens very efficiently without warming the planet. And that power piece is really interesting, right? Yeah. I think a lot of people think, oh, it's the, the data center might be the bottleneck. In the US at least, we're 10xing power demand year over year. That's hundreds of thousands of GPUs and we don't even have that supply. So it's not, I mean, X.AI, speaking of Elon, right, he's announced a massive cluster that he actually needed to find new alternative forms of energy to, to really be able to expand that to 200,000 know, GPUs. Yeah, and they're kind of uh, bringing back on, online all these nuclear power plants, Microsoft, Amazon, and others. And ironically, really at least in the US, these capitalists kind of becoming right, the, the pro-green energy and pro-investment you know, in nuclear and nuclear in know, alternative forms of fuel. Okay, now I've done that thing of giving you a nice uh, time to kind of say how great open source is, but being a journalist, I can't let you get away with that. There obviously are a lot of big concerns around this whole question of open source. As you probably are all aware, national security agencies in Washington and elsewhere are particularly concerned that opening up access to this transformative technology that you mentioned at a time when certainly Washington doesn't want China, for instance, to be able to uh, own AI um, is something that's really front of mind. Um, Tomas, now I think Hugging Face is banned in China, is that right? Or something like that, or something to that effect. But tell me about how you square this circle um, and this concern around open being uh, a way of exposing and making more vulnerable um, governmental access to key technologies. Yeah, well, I think Ravi, it's very simple, the answer for me. I'm not, I'm not an <laughs> open source absolutist. I, I don't think, like, uh, I'm not pushing for everything to be open source. I think a lot of really practical application, honestly, you can already build them today. And my starting point is that Lama 3 today is not uh, an, exist an existential risk to humanity. I think it's just a tool we can use uh, very well, you know, for some practical application. You wrap it in what you want to build. It's efficient. You have smaller models you can run on your laptop. And I think a lot of people then think, okay, about you know, next level Terminator, or that's gonna, that's gonna run out of data center. My answer is just, yeah, you can build AI application today, you just need to build them, right? You don't need to wait for the next GPT-5 to use AI. I think the, it's like a green field, it's like a lot of chocolate we just need to catch, and it's like an, an open new, new thing we can build a lot of cool application with. And my, my answer would be first, let's explore this. Then we talk about this, uh, this you know, uh, very, uh, very like uh, what you were saying, like you know, when you when you train on one million GPU and you try to reach like like AGI. I would say one of the things I also believe is you don't need a model that can solve the Riemann conjecture or or, or do a new theory of general relativity to find a, a useful business use case, basically. Right. And then for these very uh, high-level models, or one that are trained on biomedical uh, information, I think it's nice that we have some regulation. And I think we, at Hagiface, we also welcome EU regulation, US regulation. You know, I think it just makes sense. You know, if you if you push really to the limit of technology, I think you need to make sure itself. Yeah. Kunle and, and and or Grace, but Kunle, let me start with you. How, how do you see it? And also, I'd be curious to know how you see the regulatory environment. Mm -hmm developing in, in the US in particular um, at a moment when, as I mentioned, obviously you have a big AI player really at the heart of government. Yeah, so most of the regulatory, uh, you know, uh, regulatory um, restrictions come around how much compute uh, you need to train your model. So once you get to a certain level, I think 10 to the 28, you know, uh, flops, uh, then, then, you know, you've got to report to the, I think the EU has a, has a level and I think the, the, uh, the, the US government has another level. And, and then, so, so that's where the restriction comes in in terms of models, in terms of compute, right? You, we're restricted on where we can send our, uh, our chips to. You know, we can't send them to China. We've got, uh, we've got a, you know, uh, past government, uh, regulatory bodies before we can send it to, to, to view certain places in the Middle East and so on. And so, you know, the regulations around compute, uh, you know, fundamentally, are they pre preventing, uh, you know, people from, from de you know, developing huge models? No, because fundamentally, uh, they'll just use more of the, the lower performance chips or they'll, they'll find a way around, uh, around it. And so, fundamentally, I don't see any of the the uh, regulatory uh, uh, hand wringing as actually having an impact on what uh, you know uh, 
uh, governments that may, may be uh, in opposition to, to, to the ones that we live in uh, are, 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 can, can actually fundamentally achieve. Yeah, and I'll just add on to that, right? I think we're still very early, right, yeah, in, yeah. in the regulatory journey. From an open source and national security perspective, I do think we go back to where we started at the beginning, right? Open source is, in fact, leveling the playing field. Uh, I think I'll, I'll use the car analogy again, right? Everyone all around the world knows how to build an automobile, right? Uh, but what distinguishes a Japanese car from a Chinese car, from a French car, from an American car, is law in the design and the engineering and the speed and the function, ultimately, of what you want that car to do. And I think already in AI, we're seeing global-based AI models doing really well, right? In France, Mistral, the US, we have a lot of players. In China, we've seen huge contributions to the open source ecosystem already, right, with Quen and DeepSeek. Um, and I, they already have yeah, that base national models, right? So what it comes of what do we build on top? What are we taking those underlying models doing? And how are we knitting them together into orchestration to ultimately build the end product? And as a founder, I think Hugging Face has really done a great job of this. How do you put in those guardrails and how do you really be capable and thinking thoughtfully about how your product is creating that function mm -hmm. going forward? All right, tech opti optimist to the end, no doubt. Um, <laughs> look, we've got about three minutes left, and so on that note, I want to kind of ask each of you a simple question. Um, projecting into the future, um, really, if there was one thing that you're thinking about above all else for the next 12 months, and I know the AI, the tech world generally changes very rapidly, and AI is changing extra rapidly, but what is the one thing that is dominating your thinking going into uh, 2025. I'm going to start in reverse. So Grace, can you yeah. start us off, please? So I think we've seen like AI in the two-dimensional two -dimensional world. So AI in text, AI in video, AI in image, AI in audio. And I think in many ways, that's pretty saturated to me from an investor perspective. What I'm really excited about is AI in the 3D, in the physical world. We already talked about robotics. We didn't talk as much about the sciences, biology, chemistry, physics. Where are there trapped repositories of data that are not widely available on the internet that you're not going to go and be able to search and find using any of these frontier models today and where you need that specific database and knowledge workflow of how that system works? Right, couldn't they? Yeah, I think you know, I'm going to you know, double down on test time compute. It's going to be huge going forward. It's going to enable uh, the applications to do reasoning instead of just you know, uh, you know, getting a response from, from a chatbot. Uh, and, and it's going to be important in, in determining what source of infrastructure you need to actually provide the, the capabilities you want in, in complex applications that are going to be this thick layer on top of the model. Tomas, I'm going to leave with you. And also just bearing in mind, a lot of the startup folks in this crowd, what should they be thinking about? What are you thinking about? <laughs> so I'm going to answer another question. <laughs> because I, I talk already a lot about startup, and I see here a University of Helsinki, Alto right. University. One thing I'm very excited for next year is uh, AI for science, okay. which is basically using all the you know the knowledge we get now on how to train models that have predictive models that are very good, to basically do protein prediction, material chemistry prediction. Uh, we train right now on a, on a big uh, public data data center in, in France. We are training a, a fundamental model for quantum chemistry. Which, if you think about it, if you discover like a new electrode for batteries, you actually, you, know, you 10x the impact of AI. I mean, chatbots are nice, but if you can basically change physical things, it's crazy. So all this AI also for weather forecasting, there's a lot of area where we have this kind of, you know, this, this very slow, this very costly, this very uh, extremely difficult to scale simulation. And if you start to apply some generative AI to it, you can actually do huge breakthrough. I think the Nobel Prize of this year was a good example, AlphaFold. That's the example of you know, some of the amazing impact AI can have next year. Bye. For Demis Asavis, who's obviously at Google doing a non-open source <laughs> approach to AI. <laughs> Nonetheless, he's very clever and very intelligent and very uh, very. AlphaFold was open source. Yeah, okay, that's <laughs> good point. All right, cool. Um, on that note, uh, I'd please like, like to ask all of you to thank our incredible panel and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Hold well on, guys. All right, we're off.